Good afternoon. We're here at Friends of God Worship Center and Bible Institute in Tappahannock, Virginia, and we are happy to be with you today. We feel like it's been a, a long time since we um, had a message to bring to you from our sanctuary, um, and so we're just happy to be here today to share with you a word from the Lord. We are um, here on Saturday at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, we are, most of our, uh, we have outreach ministry, and uh, usually we record from our, from our sanctuary here though. Uh, if you'd like to join us sometime, we are at Friends of God Worship Center at 149 Queen Street in Tappahannock, Virginia. So today, we, I want to take you on a journey today. And we're going to talk about God's kingdom on earth. And this is a subject that Jesus talked about a lot. But I want to take you on a journey kind of back to the beginning uh, from Genesis. Uh, if you follow us on YouTube or on our website, you'll notice that I go back to Genesis quite a bit. I like going back to the foundation. So we're going to talk today about God's kingdom on earth. Where did it come from? How did it get started? And why did Jesus talk about it so much? So that's the journey that we're going to go on today. So first of all, as I said, I want to take you back to Genesis, the first chapter and the very first, uh, the first chapter and starting with the 26th verse. When God created everything, when he put everything in place, made a system for everything, and put everything on the earth that man would need, that's how he started his kingdom on earth. He set up the food supply, he set up the heating system, he set up all of the uh, comforts and all of the things that he knew man would need here on earth. And then he created man to then come and colonize or uh, have dominion over the earth. And we can see this starting in Genesis, the first chapter, verse 26 through 31. And I'm going to read this from the King James Version. And I'll give you a chance to turn there for those of you who are following along with your Bibles. I also like the uh, Message Bible, so occasionally I will read both from the King James Version and from the Message Version. But this, uh, this scripture kind of lets us know how God got things started. So when we look at Genesis, the first chapter, starting with verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and, like, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of, the, of all the earth, and every tree in, in the which is the fruit of a tree, yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. 
And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So, you know, I, I read that, and I know that for uh, those of you who are Bible scholars, this is a very familiar account of creation for you. But when we look back at all that God did in the beginning, he was setting things up systematically. Set up the food supply, like I said. He set up everything, the, the, the heating system, the, the, uh, the sun, and the seasons. He put all of that in place. And it's not haphazard. You know, we have day and night, and it happens the same way every month, every month, every year. It's systematic, and it's been going that way since the creation of time. So our God is not a haphazard God, but he does things on purpose. He does things for a reason. He puts things in place because he knows exactly what he's doing. He's all, he already has the plan in place before he gets started. It's just like an artist that paints a picture or a builder that builds a building. You always start out with a plan. You start out with an outline before you start actually building or painting the picture or building the building. Well, God is no different because the scripture says right here that God created man in his image. Isn't that right? So in the beginning, when God set up his kingdom here on earth, he had a plan in place for that kingdom. He had a plan in place for all the inhabitants. He had a plan in place for what was going, going to happen. So just like God had everything in place for his plan, that plan has never died. That plan has never gone away. He made all of this for us because he wanted to give us dominion over the territory of earth. He already had his kingdom set up in heaven, but now he wanted to set up his kingdom here on earth. And he wanted to create man and give him dominion over that kingdom on earth. Now I did a little research and I looked up the word dominion and dominion is the territory of a sovereign or a government. That's what dominion means. So when God created man in his image, he created man to have dominion over what he had created here on earth. I also looked up the Hebrew word, which is memshalah, and that also means rule, dominion, or realm. God the creator has always intended for mankind to have dominion over the territory of earth. When you look at any kings throughout history, kings always have a territory that they rule over. And it was no different when God created his kingdom here on earth. He set man in place to rule over the territory, the piece of real estate called Earth. So when, when we think back and we look back again now, if we turn back to uh, Genesis, the first chapter, verse three through five, we can see how God set that up from the beginning. There were, it was his kingdom, but then there was also a kingdom of darkness. So when we look at chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, and it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. Now I want you to pay close attention to that. He separated, he, he saw that the light was good. Okay? Hold on to that thought. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light 
Day. And Day has a capital D, which means it's a proper name. He called the light Day, and the darkness he called Night. Night also is a proper name with a capital N. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So you notice here that he divided light from day. He divided day from night, light from darkness. So what he was doing at that point was dividing the kingdoms right then. Light, he said, was good. Hold on to that because we're going somewhere with that. Now, light was called day, and he declared it to be good. Now, he's the creator, so he can make declarations on whatever he wants to make a declaration on. So he decided that the light was good, and that's what he said. That's what he declared into the atmosphere at the time of creation. Darkness was called night, and no declaration was made over darkness, whether it was good or indifferent. He just said, and he separated the light from the, from the darkness. That's all he said about the darkness. If you look at it from the standpoint of a family, day and night were siblings, but night envied day. I'm sure that you, all of us have families, and I'm sure that there are times uh, when there have been sibling rivalries in your family, if not in your own, in your children's. We can, we can see how that happens. Well, Adam and Eve were created after that separation happened between day and night. And so, God intended for mankind, or Adam and Eve, to rule over the real estate earth that he had created along with light or day. Now when you look back at Genesis, you'll be able to, you'll be able to read that for yourself. All of this is in chapter one of Genesis. Now, once the man and woman were created, and given dominion over the earth. And we can see that when we look at Genesis, the um, first chapter, and I'm gonna go back and review this again, because in the, 28th in the 28th verse, he said, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over. That's where I want to emphasize right there. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth on the earth. So he, he gave them their commission right there. They were to have dominion, that means rulership, they were in charge of all of the things that God had created. And so uh, when, that, when darkness or night observed this happening, that's when the rivalry kind of uh, took, a, a, took on a new meaning. Because now the sibling rivalry was about to really ramp up. So when all of this happened, God had given mankind, or Adam and Eve, a decree, and he told them that they had all these trees to eat from for food. They could use that for their, uh, their herbs and the garden for their food. But he said, it's just one tree, just one tree that I don't want you to eat from. I don't even want you to touch it. So now when you think about it, they had the whole garden at their disposal. They, didn't, they certainly weren't hungry and had to eat from this one tree that God told them not to, but they did. And the reason why they did is because Satan or darkness sent a salesman into the garden 
to sell the idea to Adam and Eve to go ahead and eat from this garden, I mean from this tree. Now let's look at um, Genesis the second, I'm sorry, Genesis the third chapter. Genesis the third chapter, and this one is where we see the fall of man or where uh, man disobeyed what God told him to do. But he didn't just do it on his own. There was some help. Those of you that are familiar with, this, with the uh, story, um, Satan embodied the serpent that was in the garden. The scriptures say that he was subtle, meaning he was, he was good looking. He was, um, he was uh, better looking than some of the other animals. He was smarter, he was cunning. So when the serpent came in the garden, he came as a salesman to sell Adam and Eve the other kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. He wanted to disrupt what God had put in place. He wanted to interrupt what God intended for the dominion to look like for man and woman, for male and female. He wanted to interrupt that and to pull them over to his side, over to the kingdom of darkness so that he could have rule over them instead of God. Well, the serpent did a pretty good sales job on Adam and Eve because in, in uh, chapter three, we see how he persuaded them to go ahead and eat from that tree. You know, sometimes the grass looks greener on the other side until we get there. And so that's what happened to Adam and Eve. Here they had dominion over this wonderful garden. Everything that was created was under their rulership. And they had it made. They, God set them up and they had it made. But uh, Satan, embodying the serpent, did a good sales job on them because he made it look like well, no, you know, God, God wants you to go, he does, he's, he's not going to kill you if you eat from this tree. He just knows that you'll be smarter, that you'll have, you'll have knowledge of good and evil if you eat from this tree. And he just doesn't want you to do that because he wants to have his thumb on you. He wants to be able to rule over you. If you eat from this tree, you can rule over yourself because you will know the difference between a good and evil yourself. That was the sales pitch. That was the sales pitch. And just like so many of us, to Adam and Eve, the grass looked greener on the other side. But man, once they got over there, once they disobeyed, once they took the bite from the fruit, they bought into a different kingdom. At that point, they publicly denounced the kingdom of God that he had intended for them to set up on earth. And they embraced the kingdom of darkness, which Satan had tricked them into by using the, the serpent as his salesman in the garden. One thing that we have to realize is that when God created us in his image, he created us with free will. God will not force his will on us because he gave us freedom of choice. We have to choose him. He's not going to force us to choose him. We have to choose him of our own free will. In other words, we have to pick, we have to choose the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of darkness. And that's the choice that Adam and Eve had. And once they made that choice, they passed that kingdom down the line to us. And we are still influenced by the kingdom of darkness today. But don't, don't give up, there's good news. There's good news because all through history, we can see this, the uh, consequences of choices that are made from the recorded history of the kings in the Bible, uh, 
the, the um, people in the Bible that have been written about, the actions that they took, we can see the consequences. Some of those consequences are good. Some of the choices that they made were good choices. And we can see the consequences of those good choices are good things happening to them. But then there are consequences of the bad choices as well. And throughout biblical history and throughout the secular history, we can see what happens when people make choices, whether they're good choices or bad choices. Some of those uh, choices we can see in the book of Genesis, again, this time chapter 4. Because it talks about, chapter 4 talks about the birth of Cain and Abel. Here we go again with that sibling rivalry. Because Cain and Abel were brothers. They were Adam, Adam and Eve's children. Cain made sacrifice to God. And Abel made sacrifice to God. But don't you know that God knows our heart and he knows everything about us? And he accepted Abel's sacrifice and he did not accept Cain's. My guess is that God could see the motive inside of them and Abel's um, offering to him was more sincere. Now that's just my guess. Back to the story though. He accepted Abel's sacrifice. Cain got jealous. He was filled with envy uh, towards his brother. And so he killed him. The action, and then the consequence was he got kicked out. He got kicked out. And so Cain was marked as well. And he was no longer um, able to communicate with God. He kicked him out. So that was a consequence from a choice that he made. The choices mankind made under the other government were so bad. Once Cain got out, was kicked out, and he started multiplying with, with his wife that he took with him, and the population started to grow, and without the influence of God at all, without the influence of, his, of God's kingdom, Cain's children, Cain and his children started to make so many bad choices. They were more influenced by the kingdom of darkness than of the other government. So God got so fed up that he was even sorry that he had made mankind and decided to destroy mankind. But God always has a remnant. He always has a remnant. And that, and that person that um, God, that singled himself out, that made the choice to follow God was Noah. Noah was a descendant of Adam and Eve's son, Seth. Seth was born after Abel was killed and Cain was thrown out. So Noah was a descendant of Seth's. Noah was so good, he had such favor with God that he walked with God. That's found in Genesis, the sixth chapter. If you're um, writing these scriptures down, you might want to go back and read some of these stories if you haven't done so already. And if you have, go back and refresh yourself. But Genesis, the sixth chapter, and we're going to look at verse 8 and 9. And this says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is after God decided to that he was just fed up with how man was acting, and he was just going to wipe them out. It says, Noah found favor, grace and, and favor with him. And verse 9 says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now, Noah walked with God 
and that that means that he was he was good he communicated with God he had a relationship with him so because he had a relationship with him Noah was able to be in God's grace and that's the reason why he was the one chosen to build the ark save him and his family and uh, the animals that God allowed to, to come on the ark with him. God always has a remnant. All the way through history, when mankind starts acting up, when governments start warring with one another, and they just can't seem to get it together, there's always a remnant that God has to preserve his original intent that he had in the Garden of Eden. When Noah obeyed God, did exactly what he said, God made a covenant with Noah to start all over, and he gave mankind another chance to choose the right kingdom. He had wiped out all the ones that had gone so far away from him and was following the kingdom of darkness. But through Noah and through Noah's three sons, he gave mankind a chance right there to start over, to make the right choices, and to follow the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light. Genesis 9-1, we're going to turn to that as well. Genesis 9-1, this is where God gave Noah and his sons the same blessing that he had given Adam and Eve in the garden. It says in chapter 9, verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Listen to this now, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Remember he gave that same blessing to Adam and Eve? back before they made the wrong choice. So here God was, his, his original intent had not died. His original intent was still there for mankind to have dominion over the earth and over everything that he had created. So this was the promise, this was the blessing that God gave Noah, just like he did Adam and Eve in the garden. So God gave Noah and his sons both the herbs and the animals for food. That was the difference. Adam and Eve did not have the animals. They only had the herbs. But once the, he destroyed er, everything that was on the earth and preserved Noah and his sons, not only did he give him the herbs, but he also gave, them, gave him the animals for food. The only exception there was that you don't eat the animals with the blood in, still in them. So this was what happened with Noah. God was still trying to show mankind, here, make the right choice. Choose the kingdom of God. Make the right choice. Noah's sons did multiply, and they did replenish the earth, but the wickedness of the other kingdom was still multiplied through the generations. Noah was a man that walked with God. He had that relationship. I'm sure he taught his sons, but somehow the kingdom of darkness still had that seed within the uh, seed of man. And as they multiplied, they, they went away from God again. They went away from the the kingdom of God, and still they held on to the kingdom of darkness. God tried again. Throughout history, we can see how God was, is constantly trying to get our attention as, as human beings, to get our attention and put things in place so that we can come back to the right kingdom. So we can see um, th that God chose the seed of Abraham. You know, Abraham and Sarah is a popular story in the Bible. 
And God made a promise to them that his seed would be multiplied like the sands of the, of the uh, sea, like the stars of the sky. And so through Abraham's seed, his people, he would still have a remnant on the earth through uh, Abraham's seed. So through Abraham came Moses. Moses was through the seed of Abraham. Moses was chosen by God to bring instruction to, his, to God's people. So when Moses went up on the mountain and he brought down the Ten Commandments, and we look in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, all of the law that was laid out, this was a guideline to get God's people prepared for coming back to the kingdom. You know, during that time, after Moses and the people were in the wilderness, they had another chance to choose the right kingdom. God does not force us to do anything, and he didn't try to force them to do anything. God asked them, will you make a covenant with me? For me to be your God and you to be my people. And the people agreed. But then when, Mo when God sent Moses down off the mountain with the instructions, guess what the people were doing? They had built an idol, a golden calf, and they were worshiping something else other than God. Something that they made with their own hands instead of the almighty God. So here we were again. God gave us a, a mankind a chance again to choose the right kingdom. And yet, there was failure again. So keep in mind, though, that God has his original intent and he is going to see it through. We are the ones that are holding it up, mankind. So after Moses and then the, the people uh, died off in the wilderness that built the golden calf and there was a remnant again. You see this throughout the scriptures. God always has a remnant. So that remnant then chose to follow God. And God had told Abraham that he was going to give them all this land. So guess what? There were wars for the land, but God always uh, saw his people to be victorious. He fought for them. So when they were fighting for the land, and when they settled in the land, then they decided that they wanted to have a king just like all the other kingdoms that they had seen around. So they wanted to have a king too. That's a wrong answer. All this time, God wants them to look to him as their, as, as their king. He wants, to look, he wants them to look to him for their kingdom. They wanted to choose a king like the ones that had chosen the kingdom of darkness. So, as I said, God is not going to force us to do anything that is against our will. So he allowed them to have a king. The first king was King Saul. Well, Saul died, and then David was anointed king. David was anointed king over Judah first, and then later on over Judah and Israel, because there was a division uh, in the kingdoms. So David, and David, God called David a man after his own heart. David wrote a lot of the songs that we see in the Bible. But God considered him a man after his own heart. Was he perfect? No. You'll read in the scriptures, David made a lot of mistakes. He did a lot of things that were not pleasing to God. But in his heart, he loved God. He always came back to God and asked him for forgiveness and asked him to show him the way. And so God chose the kingdom of David 
And he told him that his Savior would come out of the king, kingdom of David. Guess who that Savior was? Jesus Christ himself, the Savior of the world. He came through the lineage of David. Look at how we see through history. God, through history, has tried to bring mankind back to himself. God has tried through history to bring mankind back to the kingdom and the dominion that he originally intended for them and to take uh, and, to, and to let go of the kingdom of darkness. Well, this was Jesus Christ, the savior of the world. I have some shocking news for you. Jesus did not come to set up a religion. We see all the religions that are throughout the world uh, different doctrines, different practices that say that uh, they are worshiping God. God did not send Jesus Christ to set up any one of those particular religions that we see in the world. But the reason why Jesus came is to show us and teach us about the kingdom of God. That's right. The kingdom of God, the one that he originally in, intended for us to have way back in the garden, that throughout history, mankind has, has tried and failed, and tried and failed. But here, Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, he sent down to, in the flesh, to teach us about his kingdom and to bring us back to it. Isn't that wonderful that God would love us so much that he would be so patient with us throughout history to allow us to get to this day and time where we can still have a relationship with him and we can still be restored back to the kingdom of God here on earth. Now I want to I want to look at John the first chapter we're in the new, back in the New Testament now. John, the first chapter. And we're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 5. This will tie this all in for us. John 1, John chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, In the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now I want you to just uh, pause here for a minute because remember I talked about proper names having capital letters? Well, we'll we see here in, in this verse that the Word that he's talking about has a capital letter. That's a person. That's, that's, a, that's Jesus Christ himself. He was there in the beginning when God said, let us, let us make man in our image. This is, this is the same word, Jesus, light, day, all of those were uh, words to describe the Son of God in different times in history, and in different places. So, in the beginning was disciples, when he was teaching them how to pray. But, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, it says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. And Jesus said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now I'm going to stop right there because that's the point of this message today. All through history, God has been trying to get us to come back to the original intent that he had was to have dominion over the earth and make earth look like heaven. It says it right here 
in what Jesus told us to pray for. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I want you to have a relationship with God. I want you to be able to understand the why Jesus came and what this is all about. You know, we all have a purpose. We all have a purpose in, in the big, large plan of God's kingdom here on earth. Many people are depressed, they commit suicide because they don't understand what their purpose is. Here is the purpose in the word of God. When you build your relationship with him by studying the word of God, by praying to him to understand what it is that he is teaching in the word of God, that's when you build a relationship with him. That's when you learn what your purpose is. And that's when you can make the choice to be a part of the kingdom of God instead of the kingdom of darkness. We certainly hope that you've enjoyed this message today and that you have gotten something from it. I can only point you back to the word, to prayer. Remember, when Jesus came, he died and he rose. For us, for our sins, yes, but also to restore the kingdom of heaven to us. He sent back the Holy Spirit when he ascended back to heaven to be our comforter and our teacher. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to understand how to get back to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. We thank you for joining us today. We're Friends of God Worship Center and Bible Institute here in, at 149 Queen Street in Tappahannock, Virginia. And we pray that you will enjoy the messages that are on our website and also on our YouTube channel.